Um, I've uh, got a presentation here, and I'm going to kind of split it up in, into two parts. Um, one is I, I want to talk a little bit about the crypto bear market and why we're probably closer to the end of this bear market than in the middle of it. Uh, and then I want to switch gears and talk about why following this bear market, there's uh, a long runway for why crypto uh, could still produce really big returns once we're back in a bull market. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to take us uh, back to my days at JP Morgan. So this is uh, my research team. Uh, that's me. Um, the guy in the upright, Sam Doctor, he joined me from JP Morgan. He's our quant strategist. And Tom Block is our policy guy. He uh, was at JP Morgan for 20, he was head of policy for 21 years, and he does policy strategy for us. And our technical analyst, or technician, is Rob Slimer, and he came from RBC. But the three of the four of us work together at JP Morgan. And the reason I want to take you back to 2008 is not because of uh, the Genesis block. I'm actually taking you back to before Bitcoin was created, uh, to the great financial crisis, okay? And the reason 2008 matters is the stock market and the recession we had in 2008 was the largest ever since the Great Depression, okay? So we had a, essentially a black swan event none of us uh, really expected to see in our lifetime and in 2008, at J.P. Morgan, where I was a chief equity strategist, we were living history in the middle of the worst bear market ever uh, in anyone's lifetime. But what's interesting is uh, I have a cover from a report we published in November, because uh, we did a study uh, about bear markets. It's dated November 2008. So again, this is only you know, in the middle of that crisis. And we found something pretty interesting about the bear market. Because you have to remember, in November 2008, uh, you had uh, the public in panic. You had Occupy Wall Street. You had uh, a lot of people saying the world was ending and Europe was actually in crisis. And we had major intervention by central banks. And we had even a lot of turmoil in elections because people were very worried. And our conclusion from this piece, from again, November 2008, was that there's a very easy way to look at bear markets. And if our view was correct, again, this is November 08, we could get comfortable and have an idea when that bear market would end. So we called the report Guide to Stock Bottoms, um, part one. We were going to publish part two once it was over. And um, so this chart is actually how most people conventionally think of bear markets. They think of it as a function of price decline plus time. And, uh, I'm highlighting here that the Great Depression lasted 34 months, and uh, the period of stagflation, which was uh, when Jimmy Carter was around, uh, actually Pope Nixon then pre-Carter, but that was uh, two years, and the, po the crash following the internet bubble was two and a half years. So in po most people's minds is that by 2008, if the market peaked in October 07, the bear market should not be ending until 2010, 2011, okay? So in no one's mind should we be thinking that a bear market would be ending soon in November 08, but we instead published a different assertion. And our assertion at the time was that bear markets are actually retracements. Um, so the idea is that a bear market only takes prices back to a level before the bull market started. And look, I know people talk about it today and they talk about TA, but actually when you think about it in the macro sense, nobody in 08 was really believing in this concept of retracement. And we just simply pointed out that the Great Depression and the stagflation uh, had a lot of commonality, which was they were, it was essentially 100% retracement of the bull market, and that's when the bear market ended. And so then we made this uh, prediction and at J.P. Morgan, we're, we were known for folks who do analysis, not opinions, but our analysis said that we thought the bear market would bottom at 667 to 720 before May 09. <clears throat> and that's just simply using uh, 
the concept of a retracement. So again, in November 08, even though people thought the world was ending, we were actually turning kind of optimistic because we thought we were near the end of the bear market. <clears throat> and of course, if we look back, where did the bear market end in the S&P 500? It bottomed at 666. So it bottomed within one point of where we thought it would end, and this is in 2008. So that turned out to be one of my best calls. It actually made me quite uh, well known at JP Morgan because we called the bottom, uh, before the bottom, actually. And we turned bullish on stocks in February 09. Um, and uh, for many years, we were known as the Uber bull. Now, I want to talk about this bear market because we're in a crypto bear market. And I think it, it's helpful to start with 2014. So this is um, <clears throat> Bitcoin. And I've marked some dates here. The, uh, the peak there is 1100. That's November 29, 2013. And I marked the price one month before Bitcoin's peak, which is October 2013. And Bitcoin was 188. So you had a bear market in 2014, 400 days. But notice that the price bottomed on January 2015 at 180, roughly, which was the price Bitcoin was at the end of October 2013, meaning it took more than a year for Bitcoin price to fall to where it was one month before it went parabolic. So let's say that that's defined the bottom of the 2014 bear market. There was another coincidence, too. Um, the mining cost of Bitcoin in 2014, the break-even cost, was 190 to $200, and Bitcoin bottomed essentially at the cost of mining. So uh, here's 20, or here's 2018, and that's the 19,000 Bitcoin price. But the price of Bitcoin one month before the parabolic move was 5,600. So what's interesting is that if 2014's analog plays out, Bitcoin should be bottoming around 6,000. And I think that's why you're seeing Bitcoin hold at these levels. Uh, but something else is interesting. Bitcoin's break-even mining cost, and something we talked about from our quant side, is the break-even cost is around 6,000. And again, that's where Bitcoin seems to be trying to find its bottom. And uh, so if you look at these charts, uh, kind of laid, overlaid together, it, in some ways, maybe, you know, you shouldn't be too bearish now because, you know, we're, we're probably closer to the end of the bear market. I'm not saying that there isn't downside, and I know a lot of technicians um, and technical analysis is very important in crypto see further downside, but I guess my point is I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time below 6,000. And, in fact, uh, I think the bear market for Bitcoin is probably over. It's still happening in altcoins. This is the price performance of various crypto constituents. We, we sectorized the market since April. And as you can see, Bitcoin is up uh, about 10% <clears throat> since April. But it's really altcoins and platforms and exchanges that have been in a continuing bear market. And they're down anywhere from 40 to 50%. Um, and again, this is just showing you year-to-date performance that if you look at active users, the change year to date, and the y-axis is the price performance, the tokens that have done the best are the ones that have had growth in the user base. And you can see Ethereum Classic is right there, uh, but Doggy Coin EOS and Stellar Lumen. Uh, so there's obviously a high correlation. The market's actually being rational. They're just devaluing projects that don't have uh, a lot of users. And uh, this should make you feel a little better about the world, too. This chart uh, shows you the percentage of altcoins that are down 70% in the past, six, uh, past nine months. And uh, the first peak you see there is October 2014. And that number hit almost 90%. And, uh, that was essentially the peak of the altcoin bear. And today, that number is 96%. So we're essentially at the same level where alts began to rally uh, in 2014. And uh, again, just to see what happened in 2014, that same orange line is at the top. 
And the bottom is coin market caps, market cap X Bitcoin. And you can see from that point, uh, Bitcoin was weak, uh, alts were weaker for another week or so, but then they actually almost tripled. So don't lose hope, I guess, is that first part of our message. Um, and uh, again, a reminder, because we don't want people to trade too often, if you take the 10 best days of Bitcoin in any year, that is the light blue line, okay? And the dark blue line, the dark bars, are if you owned Bitcoin but you didn't own them on the 10 best days, interestingly, you lost money uh, every year if you didn't own Bitcoin in the 10 best days. On average, Bitcoin's down 25% a year, except for the 10 best days, which of course takes Bitcoin's total return. So in other words, all the money is made in Bitcoin owning it for just 10 days a year, but since we don't know the 10 days, you might as well just hodl. Okay. All right, so uh, I've got like eight minutes left, and now I wanna talk about uh, why you should be bullish on crypto. And I think the first thing I wanna really point out is, uh, I think the real use case for crypto, or at least the most obvious uh, and logical, especially for all constituents, is replacing parts of the monetary system. And the two arguments to be made there is that one, banking is too powerful. Uh, I think everyone sort of knows that's a, it's, it's a fact. Uh, but the second is that the millennials are really more interested in sort of replumbing the financial system. And then the last part, I just wanna show you why you need to think of this as crypto fang. You know, that you wanna make, keep your strategy very simple and own just sort of the best quality projects. Okay, so uh, this is showing you trust. Trust in governments uh, is at a 60-year low. This is a Pew Research survey. Never have people distrusted their government more. Uh, banks are too powerful. Uh, five banks in the U.S. control half of all financial assets. It's not just true in the U.S. A study by the UC Berkeley shows that in many countries, the top three banks typically, typically control almost three quarters of all assets. Banking is controlled as an oligopoly. This chart shows you the banking industry's share of GDP since 1970. It's been moving up and to the right. In the last 50 years, despite technology, banking industry is actually making more money, not less. And even with Occupy Wall Street and deregulation, their share of profits is still going up. That's happening while interest rates have actually been in a secular decline. Think about it. For the last, really, for two generations, interest rates have been falling, but banks are making more money. Banking doesn't make money from interest rates. They make money from taxing the economy. So, uh, apologize, it's hard to read. How much money does the banking industry make? It's about $5 trillion a year in today's dollars. In, in a decade, it's gonna be close to $7.5 trillion. $7.5 trillion is equal to 75 iPhones, meaning there's 75 apples in the banking industry. That's how much money the banking industry makes. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the demographics. Now, all technological change, I've been in research for 25 years, uh, is always driven by a generation that adopts it. Uh, you've heard this many times <clears throat> from other folks, but uh, let me talk about the millennials for a moment. Millennials are someone born between 1980 and 2000. It's the single largest generation ever in America. Uh, you can see this number here. They're it's almost uh, 20 million larger than the boomers. And if you don't think generations matter, on the right side, I actually listed the year each generation peaked. So the greatest generation peaked 1929. Silent generation peaked in 74. The boomers peaked in 99. Anybody who's a historian of the economy knows that those are all turning points of the economy. The Great Depression started once the greatest generation peaked. We had stagflation and a huge period of misery after the silent generation peaked. And of course, we had the dot-com dot -com bubble burst when the boomers peaked. Generations drive major change. Um, so, and millennials are huge, two and a half billion globally. It's 40% of the adult population. Now, 
uh, you might all think, look, I thought millennials were a bunch of lazy people. Um, and that was probably true that millennials were young. Because see, from 2005 to 2015, millennials were primarily teenagers. But in, starting in 2018 is the year that the millennial population is actually mostly adult. So today, <clears throat> millennials are where the boomers were in 1982. So we have to think of them as how are they going to affect the economy going forward, and their impact is huge. This chart shows you the distribution of income uh, by generation. Within 10 years, millennials will be the largest, will control the largest share of the wallet in the US. And um, here's some evidence. This is from Chase, their credit card data. This is year-over-year -year change in credit card spending. You notice there's only one line that's dark blue and that's above zero. That's the millennial credit card holders at Chase. Everybody else at Chase is actually seeing a decline in spending. The only reason credit card spending is growing at Chase is because of millennials. OK, and then, uh, sorry, I just want to fly through this so I can cover everything. 92% of millennials don't trust banks. Uh, this is from First Data. 71% of millennials would rather go to the dentist than listen to what the bank says. And 33% believe that banks will actually not exist in five years. So millennials hate banks. But according to First Data survey, millennials will control $7 trillion of assets in a few years. So let's just say millennials inherit all this money, $700 billion. What if they put 10% into crypto? I'm just, I'm just throwing that number out. That's a $700 billion allocation into the crypto market. And as you guys know, the multiplier in crypto is monstrous. It's probably 20 to 25, which means that if the millennials move that much money into crypto, just in the US, we're talking about a $2.5 trillion market. OK. Um, finally, I just want to cover a few more things very quickly. Uh, Crypto is gaining some credibility in the US. I don't know if you're familiar with CFA. I think most of you guys are. That's a, it's actually a quasi-regulatory organization. The CFA is adding crypto to its curriculum. And uh, you know, the, the question that we get from our clients all the time is, look, crypto doesn't pay a dividend. It has no intrinsic value. Uh, I won't cover it here, but in the last 20 years, a lot of rules have changed. You know, we never had negative interest rates before. Companies that had no profits used to never go public. Today, 98% of companies that go public don't make money. But uh, I think the two ways people are going to look at crypto, one is the store value. Okay, and today, the store value market is $280 trillion. So most people think Bitcoin replaces gold, and that's a good analogy. But gold's only a $9 trillion market. Art is actually a larger store value market. Family offices allocate more money to art than gold, and that's a $17 trillion market. So again, crypto is not even a tenth of a percent of that market. And uh, the last way I think you need to look at crypto, I'm skipping ahead, is network value. So we addressed this at the panel today, but I want to highlight why that matters. This chart just shows you the number of internet users that existed by year. And I list the year each of these companies was created. So Amazon, which has been the best investment ever uh, in FANG, is because it was created when there were only 7 million internet users. And Facebook was created when there were 580 million. And as you can see to the right, there's 4.2 billion internet users today. Believe it or not, if you just did Metcalf's law, on that user base, 75% of the return of FANG was explained by the year that company was formed and how many users were on the internet at that time. Um, so you didn't have to do a lot of work. You could just buy uh, who was the best company. You might wonder, how do you know who's the best company? It turns out Internet 1.0 and Internet 2.0 were all created around the same time. Facebook and MySpace were only incorporated one year apart. Uh, Google and Yahoo were only created three years apart, okay? So the Internet 1.0, 2.0 were created at the same time, and it took less than five years to pick the winner from the loser. So in Facebook, it only took five years for them to surpass MySpace. It took three years for Google Search to surpass Yahoo. So in Internet time, it only takes three to five years to figure out who the winner is. 
Uh, I want to skip ahead a little bit here. Well, in crypto, you know, Bitcoin's been around for nine years. That, that's probably three generations of crypto time versus internet. So I think when you think about how you want to build your bit, you know, crypto fang, I think Bitcoin has to be one of them. Lastly, uh, I'm going to just wind, rewind a bit here. Before fang, there was consumer stocks in the 80s. Consumer stocks did almost as well as fang, and the ticker would have been, instead of calling it fang, you would have called it wicha hugga do. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, that's why they didn't have a, they didn't want to call it fang back then. Um, but $1,000 in those names turned out to be $1,200, $1.2 million by the end of, by 15 years later. So every generation sees a chance to make thousands and thousands of X on their return. And I think the easy way to think of it is active wallets. There's only 50 million active wallets today. Uh, if we look at PayPal, that's a 5X in terms of number of holders. Uh, if we get to Visa MasterCard, that's 4.6 billion, that's 100X. Well, if you have a 100X increase in wallets, you're going to have 100 times 100X increase in crypto value, which is, uh, you know, 10,000 X. So again, I think the future's bright. Um, so with that, I got to wrap up my presentation. <laughs>